Hey friends, this is Bernard from Jurassic Time with another installment in our continuing studies into all things Jurassic Park. I was privileged enough to speak at length with none other than the paleontologist Jack Horner. Dr. Horner is known for his studies on the Tyrannosaurus Rex, his work on the Chickensaurus Project, as well as his involvement as the paleontological advisor to the first five Jurassic Park films. He was kind enough to share with us his recollections from the films and his career. We talked a bit about the modern comparison of animals and even looking at modern biomes and environments. We know that dinosaurs have been found across the globe, including Antarctica. But the films, of course, take place in Costa Rica or are filmed in Hawaii in the Redwood Forest of California. So we generally are only seeing tropical environments without too much ecological diversity. With your work on the film, did you ever have discussions about including environments or think that there will come a time when we, the films might represent them? We, we don't, you know, we don't have a fossil record from anywhere tropical, so. <laughs> <laughs> I like that response. There's a very succinct but profound response. But that's an expectation people have, right? I mean, Correct. dinosaurs Correct. are going to live in the tropics because, you know, who knows why, because that's... You know, the last ones, that's probably where they are, is, you know, hidden somewhere in eastern Tanzania. Right. And all these discussions of lost worlds being in some tropical environment, holdouts from extinction still living in the middle of jungles. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's where, that's where they always are. But, you know, our, our every, everything, you know, our fossil record, you know, is, is not tropics. It's rivers, right? They're, they're, they're fossilized in rivers, river systems. That's what they're in. So, and and when we look at the kinds of plants and and sorts of things that that we find associated with them, it looks like they're you know living in rivers in in mostly in environments that look kind of like Louisiana. And there isn't a lot of diversity in the world at that time. Uh, the world was ice free, and so. You know, Antarctica looked a lot like Louisiana as well. So, so, um, and, you know, for most of the time the dinosaurs lived in North America, there was a seaway that split North America in two. So, so storms like, you know, hurricanes building up in the Gulf of Mexico have literally driven themselves right up the middle of that thing up into, you know, Northern Alberta, Canada. And that includes the, all that warm air. So, and that's the reason, you know, you find alligators in Alberta now, fossil, the fossil ones. The whole world was just a lot less, there just weren't very many different biomes. Hmm. And that actually speaks a bit to the ankylosaur that they found in Canada that was so well preserved. And they said it was because there had been a storm and it had fallen into the water and sank and became mummified and preserved. But the whole, you know, the whole world is like that. And so, you know, you don't, basically the only thing that's really similar is you would, you would still have a dark period, right? And so, you know, that is one of the cool things that we're learning now and, uh, is, you know, we're finding a lot of dinosaurs, including, you know, baby dinosaurs in the North Slope of Alaska, right? So, so these animals were living through a pretty dark period, which is interesting. You know, I, it, it probably wasn't that cold, but but it was dark. And so, you know. Yeah. They would have to learn how to survive in that environment, which means a whole different behavior as well. You know, so, you know, there's some really interesting things about dinosaurs that we just don't understand yet. You talk about them living in or near river systems. And one of the big discussions through the course of paleontological history has been about sauropods. Historically, they've been shown submerged or mostly submerged in water to support their weight, which we no longer consider to be accurate. Even in the film, Ellie says, This thing doesn't live in a swamp. Well, first, first off, there are two things you have to remember here. First off, the our fossil record is only of rivers and streams and lakes. Our, you know, dinosaurs, you know, other than the ocean sediments, you know, the, the intercontinental ocean sediments, 
our fossil record, there, there is no fossil record of tropics. There is no fossil record of Great Plains. There is no fossil record of mountainous regions. We, you know, it's impossible to have a, a, a fossil record of those places because erosion is going on there when they're, when they exist. And so river systems and, and very special river systems, they're, they're not just the everyday in fact, in North America right now, there are very few of the right kind of rivers to make fossils. We call them aggrading systems. They're, they're places where sediment is actually being deposited. And those sediments have to, you know, it has to be covered up by more sediment. And so there are very few places in the world right now where we have aggrading systems occurring. Almost everywhere in the world, the rivers are degrading. They're cutting down. They're, they're, it's like the Grand Canyon. They're cutting deep into the rocks that that were laid down before them. So, so, and so when when an animal dies and is preserved in the fossil record, it has to die next to one of these rivers. It it is covered up by the sediment in one of these aggrading rivers, and so you know. Our fossil record is, it's just amazing we have anything at all because even right now, I mean, basically nothing in North America is gonna be preserved, right? And so, unless it falls in, you know, into maybe right around New Orleans, right near the the, the big Mississippi Delta, that, that's probably only a grading system in all of the whole continent. So, so you have, that's one of the first things you have to keep in mind is, is basically everything we find is going to be in a river. It's either going to be in a river or it's going to be next to a river. I mean, it's, it can't be anywhere else. There's, it can't preserve anywhere else. So we're in a lake, you know, and, and lakes don't usually fill up with much sediment very fast. So, so they're just, you know, it, there's just so few environments where you could, you know, get a fossil that you just have, you know, so when we're trying to interpret what an animal was like, we don't really have a very good sense of it because, because you know, the animal had to die next to the river. That doesn't mean it lived in it. It might've just come down for a drink of water. There's, and then when it comes to footprints, that's sort of the same thing. I mean, you don't get footprints out in the prairie, right? You get, you get footprints, the best footprints are actually near lakes. Right. I mean, where do you leave your footprints? You, you you leave them around the edge of a lake or somewhere like that, right? You can't even hardly leave a, a footprint. Um, you could in some of these aggrading river systems, but you know, even in those, that it, it would be might be hard to find them. Most most of the most of the footprints we have are are around lakes, and if you think about a lake. First off, an animal walking down to a lake is going to get to the lake and turn right or turn left, right? Or, or wade into the lake. And so, so you're, first off, you're gonna get a whole bunch of animals going the same way just because they're walking along the edge of the same lake, right? So, so then you've got to try to figure out whether it happened at the same time or at different times and, and you know, Figuring out those behaviors is is another problem unto itself, right? But again, it's a preservation problem, right? I mean, you're just not going to get them away from the lake, and you're not going, you're not going to get very many in the lake. I mean, you know, once they start, if the water is very deep, they're they're not the likelihood they're not going to leave many footprints in there either. So. So again, you're, you've got a very limited area where you can even get footprints. And those limited areas are going to give you results that, that might interpret completely wrong, right? You might say, oh, yeah, you might say, oh, I got a whole herd of dinosaurs here, but they you know, might've walked at whole different times. Or the same dinosaur walking back and forth over a period of time. Or the same dinosaur, right? Speaking of river systems and animals that live in those biomes, in the production of JP3, there was this switch at some point from the baryonyx to the spinosaurus. 
which at the time we thought of the Spinosaurus as this massive bipedal creature with a Tyrannosaurus-like skull. Even the toys for the Lost World had it look similar. Our understanding of the Spinosaurus, of course, has continued to develop over the years, from those original finds, which were unfortunately lost in World War II, to a much more complete skeleton showing these largely aquatic creatures. What do you think of these continued changes to our understanding of the species? Spinosaurus is a very interesting dinosaur. And, and I'll have to, I admit, I mean, when, when Jurassic Park 3, when we were working on it, Stephen wanted, he wanted something big. He wanted something bigger than T-Rex. And, you know, there isn't really anything bigger than T-Rex except Spinosaurus. And, and even then we knew that you know, that Spinosaurus was a fish eater. I mean, it's got fish eating teeth. It's not, it doesn't, its teeth are completely different than a Tyrannosaurus. And yet, you know, we had, we had skeletal material that suggested that it was kind of like a Baryonyx or a Sucubimus or something like that. And so, you know, there was this suggestion that even though it ate fish, that it, you know, that it may have walked around on the land uh, like a like a Tyrannosaur. And so, you know, so that's what we created. You know, we created the Spinosaurus for Jurassic Park 3. And uh, Stephen just wanted a big, big dinosaur to fight the T-Rex. And of course, you know, do the controversial thing and, you know, do away with the T-Rex. So, but... But recently, you know, people started finding new specimens of Spinosaurus, and now it's starting to make more sense. I mean, it 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 was probably a uh, it's probably it probably never came out of the water unless it came out just to lay eggs. I mean, it 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 is a it is a it's a piscivore. It it ate fish, and it has you know basically all of the morphological features of an animal that's swimming in the in the river you know i mean it's it's an aquatic animal you cannot have an animal with exaggerated predator features without the corresponding behavioral traits and the idea of you know turning it into a a, a heron like animal i mean i think is just totally ridiculous because it it's it looks the way it does because the rest of the body hasn't yet caught up with the teeth the teeth are highly adapted and and that we're talking about like a straight line evolution where selection was really really strong toward getting these long fluted teeth which are which we see in virtually every every animal that eats fish and so you know if you're eating fish there's no reason to be out wandering around in the the desert right i mean it just doesn't make sense so so, you know, our ideas now of, of, of Spinosaurus are in line with that one scene that we see in Jurassic Park 3, where, where it's in the water and the fin sticking out of the water. I mean, that, that's like the most accurate rendition of Spinosaurus ever in, the mo in a movie, right? So, so. That still maintains. I mean, it definitely, like you said, it, it being a pescivore and uh, having the teeth as it does, and the, even the discussion about Billy saying to you know and Alan discussing how do you how do you uh, define it? Is it what species is it? Um, being able to see it in the water, and Alan even has that moment where he sees the fish and knows that something is coming. All of this was in line with the morphology of the creature, which clearly dictates what its behavior would be. Right. Another big discussion of the films is the representation of animals like the Velociraptor. Some of this is due to the translation of Crichton's work, which references a theory that Velociraptors and Deinonychus were the same species, but just different growths. In the film, of course, they're even bigger, which is partly explained to the need to fit people in them from San Winston studio so you could puppet them. But also Spielberg has been saying that the animal being at a human height to look you eye to eye is far scarier than something smaller or larger. Do you recall any discussions about the name being retained or changed due to the change in size? Yeah, it was it was Velociraptor all along, and and I I made the comment, you know, that you know it, it was more of a Dinonychus size, and he just says, you know, I like the like the, like the name better. 
Right, right. And in the new films, you have the Atrociraptor, which it seems that they picked that name due to the immediacy of understanding what its personality is. And you can tell by the name that it's going to be a scary animal. Of course, you have the Utah Raptor, which many have claimed was Spielberg's Raptor. The, the funny thing about size in dinosaurs is, is, you know, dinosaurs pretty much grow. I mean, they, 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 did, they do have a limit to how far they grow, and, and so do other reptiles. But they, they grew through most of their life. And so, then so, you know, we keep finding bigger this and bigger that, right? I mean, oh, someone just found a bigger T-Rex, and, you know, and, and it's not surprising because when we look at the bone histology, we can tell that they should be still growing. We can tell whether they reach their limit or not. And, 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 and virtually all the dinosaurs we find, I mean, you know, most of them are still growing. I mean, they're, so they were dying while they were, before they reached, you know, their terminal size. And so, you know, the, the idea of a bigger velociraptor is not out of the question. A, a bigger Dionychus isn't out of the question. Size is one of those things that, you know, is, is kind of irrelevant for dinosaurs. I mean, they can be all variety of different sizes. So. On the discussion of size, when people discover a new species and they say this is the size range, that's based on what they're seeing as far as the growth patterns. But is there opportunity for individuals to still max out both above and even below that range? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it, there is always below and unless you have yeah, unless you have the embryo um, and and above. Yes, I, you know, when people put a size on something in a dinosaur, if they don't have what we call an SF um, external fundamental system in the bone that shows that it stopped growing, then you know, it, who knows how much bigger it could have gotten. You know, mammals, we, you know, most people just keep coming back to mammals. Mammals have certain sizes they grow. They grow to a certain size. Our, 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 uh, the ends of our bones fuse to the, to the court, the, the, uh, the shaft of the bone. And that's our ultimate size. We're not going to get any bigger, but dinosaurs and, and, and other reptile, most other reptiles and, and even birds, I mean, have that capability to keep growing. And so, you know, it's, it, it's just another one of those preconceived ideas that, that, you know, kind of clouds our idea of what, what dinosaurs are really like. So they were always going to get bigger sauropods. I mean, I mean, there is a limit obviously, but, but it's not surprising when we find a bigger this or a bigger that. Size is irrelevant. Hmm. It makes me think of that saying about goldfish, where they say like it'll grow to the size of its habitat. Um, but the same go for reptiles, depending on the environment with nutrients or access to sunlight to aid in bone growth. That's fascinating to think that dinosaurs were in such a hostile environment to the point that if they were in a park setting and taken care of today, you could get these massive behemoths. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's... Like I say, most of the dinosaurs died before they reached their their uh, their true adult size, their skeletally mature size. Take a caveman that would have lived 20 years. Feed him prime meals, give him health care. He's going to live five times as long. So you mentioned you'd be going back out into the field soon. What sort of work have you been up to as of late? And what can we look forward to from you and your team in the future? Well, I, I still have a field season every summer. And so I go out in Montana and I take students from here at Chapman University where I teach. And yeah, we've got some dinosaurs to dig up next summer. So looking forward to that. Um, Duckbill dinosaurs, fortunately. I, I stay away from sauropods. <laughs> uh, too big, too hard to move. Well, yes, all yeah. the love. Uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I have a, I have a picture on my computer that I show often of, you know, of four people lifting one rib out of the ground. <laughs> that sounds like a lot. 
you know. So other than that, um, doing a lot of, you know, I, I still have, you know, we still have the Dino Chicken project going on. And, Which we will look forward to. And and I've been doing a lot of work nowadays on pachycephalosaur skulls. They're very interesting inside, and and we're learning a lot of new stuff. And I can assure you, and I can tell you over and over again, they did not butt their heads together. They couldn't do it more than once. Huh. They, they could do it once, and then that was it. They could <laughs> probably do it once, but... <laughs> Basically, be like two of two of us humans crashing our heads together. We do it only once. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fair. We kind of touched on it a little bit earlier with the discussion of the Draco Rex and the Sticky Moloch. Does that wrap up into your study on the Pachycephalosaurus? Is there anything you can tell us about that, or do we have to look forward to it? Well, we'll look forward to it. it you know, it's um, the the ontogeny is still you know there's. Draco Rex is, you know, definitely a juvenile. Uh, Stiggy Moloch is definitely, you know, a subadult, or you know, it's it's still it was still growing fast. The dome was growing very fast, so so you know, I it, that that part of the hypothesis has yet to be falsified. Not saying that it won't be, but I'm but. I certainly, I, I don't think anyone's going to argue that they're both juveniles, or at least un, they're not even close to being grown yet. Um, but, you know, there are, we are discovering new species all the time. I mean, I, you know, I, I was hoping we could sink more taxa, and, you know, find more ontogenetic sequences that, that we could sink. Um, and quite frankly, I thought we would find more, but 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 we've been finding in a lot of new taxa, and and that's interesting in itself. I think. I mean, you know, there there was more dinosaur diversity out there than 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 we've thought for a long time. But again, it goes back to the river, right? I mean. We don't have, we don't know what was living in the mountains. We don't know what was in the foothills. We don't know what was in the tropics. We don't know what was out on the great plains of, of the Cretaceous or the Jurassic. I mean, we just don't have those environments preserved. So, so it's, it's not surprising that we, you know, that we're getting new dinosaurs still. And also that there are gaps in the ecosystem. So there's opportunities for more species to exist in those areas than we even know of. Yep. Well, I absolutely appreciate how generous you've been with your time. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Uh, I look forward to everything you've got coming out. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. We'd like to send a special thank you to Jack Horner and his team from all of us here at Jurassic Time. It was an absolute privilege to get to speak with you all, and we look forward for what's to come. Until then, we invite everyone to check out Jack Horner's Dinosaurs website for more information on his exciting career, news and updates on all his projects, as well as to check out his growing NFT collection. We're also excited to announce that the Neotony NFT collection has officially arrived. Like the Origin collection before it, these art pieces will benefit research and education. Now let's take a quick peek at these brand new adorable Hypacrosaur NFTs. Links are in the description. Thank you all again for joining us for this special interview here at Jurassic Time.